In the 14th chapter of Acts, we are looking at reactions to truth. And I, I remember, I don't know if you remember the first time you got to be involved with a magnet. Remember as a kid taking a magnet and having this mysterious feeling that, that things stick, stick to it, and you don't know why, and there's nothing that you can feel there. And if you take two magnets, they either jump right together or they push against each other. And that's this kind of mysterious thing. And you know, it's funny because we as adults take it completely for granted, and you probably don't understand a clue about how it works. It's this mysterious part of the process. And I, I think it's a, a powerful illustration to talk about how the good news about Jesus is exactly like a magnet. It draws some, and it repels others, doesn't it? You see, if you can put a bunch of iron filings on top of a bar magnet, it would look like this. Not just the simple north-south uh, poles, but the, the whole field that it creates. And it was about 800 years ago that they discovered that actually the Earth is a large magnet. In fact, here's a computer projection of what the magnetic fields are that are generated by the iron elements in the core of our earth that are spinning around in there just like the, the winds do on the surface, and they're moving in the core of the planet, and that creates electricity, which then begins to create this magnetic field. And, and this is a picture of showing the different strands and essentially what we would call the North Pole and the South Pole. Now, did you know without that, invisible and for many, many years undetectable field has allowed Earth to be a place where life can happen. We would die without that because this magnetic field is keeping a shield around as the solar wind goes by. It would first take off all the ozone and then it would eventually take off our atmosphere. And this invisible deflection shield of the magnetism is keeping us safe. And it's an amazing picture again of how God has created things far beyond our understanding for us to be privileged by and to have that acceptance. But it's also, we want to focus on the chapter 14 of the book of Acts about when the truth is shared, there is both an attracting and a repelling force. Here's a, here's a picture of two magnets, and this is the iron filing showing a north-south where they're, they're drawn to each other and they're pulling and when you think about the good news about Jesus, there's some things so attractive. It's a story of a God who created us and wants to have a relationship with us. And in fact, that he sent Jesus so that he could die for our sins. What, who wouldn't want that? The, the good news of the gospel is that forgiveness can be had no matter what you've said or done or thought. And who wouldn't want that? And then the, the key part of the gospel is that if we accept and believe in Jesus, we have eternal life with him forever. I mean, if you see the truth of those things, you think, why wouldn't everybody want to be there? Well, it's partly because the gospel also has a repelling effect. This is a north-north, and they're pushing against each other. And you say, well, it's the same truth I just talked about. God is not only the king of the universe, he wants to be the judge who says what's right and wrong, and he wants control. And you see, that comes into conflict because we want control. It, it also says that even though it's wonderful that sins can be forgiven, what it also says is that forgiveness is necessary because we're sinful, and people don't like to deal with that. Have you noticed as though, even though people say nobody's perfect, they get really irritated when you start pointing out how they are not perfect? Yeah, we, we would agree with it in general. We don't want to talk about it in specifics. And then, of course, the, the fact that the Scripture also says is that there's eternal life in Jesus. There's eternal death without Jesus. And that's repelling to some, the discussion of judgment and hell. And so when you tell the truth, people have paradoxical responses. Some are drawn and say, yes, I want to know God I want to have this life with him. And some are angry and repelled and respond in perhaps rejecting kind of fashions. So I want us to look at the stories in Acts chapter 13 and 14, particularly in chapter 14. And I want to do more than just tell you these stories. 
Because when we are talking about sharing the truth, my goal for us this weekend is that you would come out of here willing to show Jesus and share Jesus, no matter what the reaction might be. Because that's what we see in Acts chapter 14. I also want you to come away with a greater understanding of how to read scripture. Because when we talk about a topical, like what God says about the family or what God says about any topic, we go through all the scriptures and we say, okay, this is now what we understand from the scriptures about that topic. When we go through textually, where we go chapter after chapter, we are also wanting to teach you how to read your Bible. Because it would be easy to go through this section and go, well, this is the same thing that happened last section. Uh, we read about him going to different towns and telling the gospel and what happened. And, and it's easy for us to skip over the surface. And I want to teach you a little bit about how to drill down and to say, what does this mean for my life today? If I read these chapters, how am I supposed to be impacted? So I'm going to start with chapter 14, verse 1. It says that Iconium, Paul and Barnabas, went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. And the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and others with the apostles. And there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them and to stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the gospel. So, Paul and Barnabas are traveling around through this part of Asia Minor and they have a plan. It says they went as usual in their plan. And Peter says, we need to have a plan because the message never changes. The message that they were telling of Jesus who had come to earth and died for the forgiveness of sins and had come alive again, can you imagine? They were going to places that never had even heard of Jesus. They were the first ones to ever tell them that story. And it's incredible that some believed right away because it would have been such a shocking new story. And then Peter says, that message you and I need to be ready to share. Because you see, it was the same 2,000 years ago. It was the same when I was a five-year-old in church and my dad preached a message about how it is that you give your life to Christ. And he had an altar call at the end of the service. And, and I felt that magnetic attraction to say, I don't know if I've given my life to Christ. I don't know if I would spend eternity with God. And so I went home that night and I asked my mom some questions about that. And, and as a five-year-old, I gave my life to Jesus. There was a whole lot more to that story, but there was a simple understanding of this basic truth, that the truth never changes. The same thing that they shared is the same thing that we stand for and the same thing that we're sharing. So Peter says, we need to have a plan. In your hearts, he said, revere Christ as Lord. First of all, you need to understand and accept and surrender to Christ yourself. And then he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give reason for the hope that you have. So when people see in your life some showing of Christ, then he says, I want you to be prepared to tell them how they can also share that hope. And then he says, but do this with gentleness and respect. So it's not just a matter of information. It's a matter of how you are ready and how you then handle that moment. And what I have found is that there are quite often a lack of confidence. So let me just ask you this question. You don't have to answer out loud. But if you're sitting in a restaurant with somebody who's showing some spiritual interest, do you feel like you have the knowledge to walk through some Bible verses, to walk through some steps so that they could come to have their basic questions answered and give their life to Jesus? I hope you feel confident in that because what I've learned is that people will not start a conversation they're not sure they can finish. And if you're not sure you can get all the way through without getting stuck somewhere, you will never start. And so I have a gift for you. 
We want you to be able to clearly define what it means to tell somebody about Jesus. And I'm going to use perhaps one of the most popular or most commonly printed formats in the world. It's called the Four Spiritual Laws. How many of you are familiar with this, Four Spiritual Laws? Yeah, it was actually put together by Campus Crusade, Bill Bright, in the 60s, I think. And he said simply, just like there are physical laws that govern our physical universe, gravity, magnetism, those kinds of things, so there are spiritual laws that govern the spiritual universe. Okay, interesting idea. They were particularly focused on college students at that time. So law one, God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. That's the attraction of the gospel, isn't it? Law two, mankind is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, we cannot know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. You're lost. You're outside. You're sinful. Mm, that's the repelling part of the gospel. Law three, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for my sin. Through Jesus, I can know and experience God's love and plan for my life. For most people, that's a plus and a minus. You talk about God, people are usually fine with that. You talk about Jesus, he was a pretty cool guy. We loved him, you know, love your neighbor and all that stuff. But when you say Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God, sparks fly. That's the harsh. And in our culture today, it's becoming less and less popular, is it not? And then law four, it says we must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. How simple is that? There's a God that loves us. There's a problem with sin. Jesus is the only solution. Are you willing to surrender? And if you're interested in that, I've got some printed up here on the, on the platform, and we've got some out in the lobby. And you can pick one of those up, because I want you to be confident that when Peter says you need to be ready to give an answer, you are ready. And that you could sit down without cheat notes and without your Bible, and you could just share from your heart Here's what God's done in my life, and here's how he can do the same for you. Because you see, when you're showing Jesus in your life, there will be some that will maybe come along and be interested in finding out why you have the hope that you do. So let me catch you up with where we are in this story. This is the, the map of the places where uh, Paul and Barnabas went last week, and then this week. It starts in this Antioch. And there's another Antioch. They must have had a name shortage, so they had to double up. So this is the Antioch where they were beginning the missionary journeys. They went to Barnabas' home island of Cyprus. Now they're coming up to, this is called the Pisidian Antioch. And then they're going to go to Iconium and Lystra and Derbe. Everywhere they go, they take the gospel. They begin to share the story. And even though the messages the message never changes. The circumstances do. So we just read about Iconium. That's their general MO. That's what they do most of the time. They went to a new town. They go to the Jewish core. That's, the Jews have been scattered all over the world. And so they gathered in synagogues or prayer groups. And everywhere he walks, you see they, they go through and they first, why do they start with the Jews? Well, they already know about God. They already understand that there was a Messiah prophesied. They, they already have some of the foundation stones. And so Paul and Barnabas would come in. They would point out that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. They would point people to the fact that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, that they were there as witnesses. And so a lot of those Jewish people were already prepared. And so some would believe and then you read it, and a day or two or a week or two later, the reaction comes. And so then they say, fine. In fact, uh, Paul has this great line in chapter 13. He says, if you don't consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we'll go to the Gentiles. <laughs> and they, uh, they shake the dust off their feet, and then they go to the Gentiles, and they begin sharing the truth with them. Now, the gospel never changes, but the way that you share with the Jewish core is different than the way you share with the Gentiles. You see, in, we have an example in Acts chapter 17. Paul is going to uh, a town of Athens that has, he's not with the Jewish core, he's actually talking to a Greek philosopher group. And he doesn't mention the Old Testament, and he doesn't quote any of those references to the Messiah. Why? They have no clue about it. So he talks to them about, 
I went through your city and I saw all these idols here. And somebody said that there's more idols than people in the city of Athens at the time. They were very religious. And then just in case they missed any, they put an idol up and it said to the unknown God, like Mr. Miscellaneous, in case we missed somebody. Here's kind of a slop category. And that's where Paul starts. He said, I saw that you have a, a statue to the unknown God. Let me tell you about that unknown God. And then he doesn't quote the Old Testament. He quotes some Greek poets. And I use that just to say to you, it's great to have a plan for how you share the story of Jesus, but it will not work every time the same way. Sometimes when I'm sharing my story, I tell about how you can receive Christ as a child. Sometimes when I'm talking to somebody who's struggling with doubt, I talk about my experience as a high schooler and all the questions I had and the struggles I went through and how God brought me through that. Why? Because that part of the story is relevant to them. That's where they are. So this idea of sharing the gospel is that I'm building a bridge so that the person I'm talking to has the greatest possibility of receiving. So the circumstances change. Iconium, kind of standard fare, how they usually did it. Then they went to Lystra, and there's this whole weird story about Paul and Barnabas come in, they see a guy there that needs healing, and so they heal him. And all of a sudden, the town decides that this is the, the gods Zeus and Hermes come in the flesh, and they call the, the temple of the the God to Zeus, and he brings out the welcome wagon, including bullocks that they're going to sacrifice to them, and they're, they're going to bow down and worship them. That's kind of an awkward reception, shall we say? And so Paul and Barnabas are going around saying, no, 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 we don't worship, don't worship us. We're just people like you. <laughs> and then he starts telling them about Jesus. In fact, he says, we want you to leave these worthless things. Can you imagine the guy who's been a priest of the temple of Zeus all his life? And Paul says, yeah, leave that stupid stuff. Come on over to Jesus. Well, if there's anything that illustrates the fickleness of human nature, it's this story. Because they go from worshiping them in one moment to they're ready to kill them the next. Why? Because of the repelling force of the gospel. To choose to follow Jesus, you have to give up on Zeus. You have to give up on being your own God. And so I think that that references this idea as we go through that the circumstances change, so therefore the methods change. And God has used many, many methods over the years. Billy Graham crusades, films, online studies, all kinds of things God can use to bring people to understand the message of Jesus, and to make that acceptance. The message never changes. The circumstances are different. Therefore, the methods have to be different. And sometimes people get welded to, if you share the gospel, it has to be this way. And it isn't always that way. That way works for some situations. If you're a fisher man or woman, you know that not one lure doesn't catch all kinds of fish. You switch depending on what you're going for. So, I think that's something we watch as we walk through the book of of Acts chapter 14, or if we watch through the story. And Paul kind of gives us the passion of his heart in 1 Corinthians. He says, although I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Paul said, when I'm going out with the gospel, I want to have as many tools in my tool belt as I can, and more than that, I want to personally build a bridge to people. You see, Jesus provided the bridge to heaven, but he is now giving us the privilege of providing the bridge where people can see Jesus in us. And so he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, although I myself am not under the law. So he says, when I'm in a Jewish context, I don't bring up bacon, right? I I wash my hands like they wash their hands. I I follow their traditions. I follow their holidays. I do what they do. Why? Because all of those differences are not the point. I'm trying to help them see Jesus. You see, quite often, we have a tendency, and I hope you're mature enough, to have learned to love people you don't agree with. Some of you haven't got there yet. 
the ability to love people even if they're wrong about something gets more important the older you get. Why? Because the more you realize how wrong other people are. And there's only one other person in the world you completely agree with and you're a little suspicious of them. Because we got it figured out now. And Peter says, or Paul says, when I'm around the Jews, I fit into the culture. Why? Because that's not the important part. Jesus is the important part. And then he goes on and he says, to those not having the law, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish group, I became like one not having the law, though I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law so as to win those not having the law. So he says, when I go to the Gentiles' house and they cut off a big slab of ham and put it on my plate, I just eat it. I fit in with them. We don't talk about Jewish holidays. We don't talk about all of the rituals. Why? Because if I'm paraphrasing him, he's saying, I'll do anything short of sin to win people. I'm not under their law. Of course, he said, I'm still under Christ's law. I still have my conscience before God. But all these other details. And then he goes on to say, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. Here's his purpose statement. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I hope that that's the beat of your heart as well. That you say, I will not let all of the other barriers that could divide us, divide us from Christ. To the extroverts, I become like an extrovert. I, I become like somebody who loves the U of O or OSU, or I become a Republican or a Democrat, or whatever those things are, because it's so easy for us to get offended by or defend other people with things that are not about Jesus. And what happens is Jesus has enough offense to go around. And either people will be attracted to him or repelled by him. And he goes on to say, I want to do it by all possible means. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So his mission statement was, I don't want to let anything get in the way of having a chance to share with somebody what it means to follow Jesus. And you know that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's really what he's talking about, isn't it? Is loving people. Building a bridge to their world, being a part with them, connecting to them, loving them, that's showing Jesus. But then there's also sharing Jesus. And I find that some Christians are saying, well, I just want to live a life with Christ and let people see him in my life. I never want to, like, say the words. That might get messy. And obviously, that wasn't Paul's motive. That was his desire, is to open up a door so that they could finally hear. Now, what happens when you share the truth? Well, this passage, 13 and 14, illustrates what almost always happens. There are three possible responses when somebody hears that you are a follower of Jesus, that you go to church, that you believe whatever the truth is, whatever that might be. And the, the cool part is that some will believe. And there should be such excitement about that. Chapter 14, 1, it says, they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed, which is incredible. Imagine here they are new in town. They're just telling about the story of Jesus. They didn't know anything about it before. And they go, Wow, that draws me. There's a magnetism. That's the truth. I recognize it. Did you know everybody that believes in Jesus is a miracle? Yeah. That God has to draw us. In fact, he says in chapter 13, it says, all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Calvinists love that verse. It says there's this mysterious process where, where God says, whoever believes in me will have eternal life. And then when you say, I choose to follow you, Jesus, he says, I've known you since before the foundations of the earth. That he chooses us and draws us. That's why we can accept. So some will respond, and we should celebrate that. Last week, Pastor Craig talked about how he came to faith and our journey together. And I'll tell you, when you get to the end of your life, you will not celebrate how many houses you built or how many jobs you had or how, many money, how much money you made or how many medals you scored but you will celebrate how many people you helped in their spiritual journey because those things last forever. And you know when we have somebody get baptized and they come up out of the water, the, the, the job of the whole group is to cheer and to clap and to celebrate. 
Because when somebody chooses to follow Jesus, it's a big deal, isn't it? And if you're ever sitting here with a friend of yours who is not yet a follower of Jesus, and they hear about the message, and God begins to work in them, and you get to be part of them coming to faith, there is nothing better. And God can use you. However perfectly or imperfectly you share, God can use you. So that's an awesome response. And then there's also a secondary response, and this is far, far more common. It says that some decided to explore further. In chapter 13, he says, as Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. Come back and let's talk. And that is normal. You know, most people have to hear about a true presentation of what Jesus is about about seven times before they come to faith. So the Bible uses spiritual birth as an analogy that in a physical birth, there's conception and there's gestation and then there's birth. The same thing happens in a spiritual birth. There's a conception, there's a moment when the word of truth comes into that life, usually through somebody who's a follower of Jesus, sharing with them or pointing them to the scriptures or in some way planting that seed. And then there is a, a process of questioning and wrestling and counting the cost. And, and there is a process that we should not hurry. That has to become to developed. But then there's a point where the Spirit of God will say to them, okay, you've had enough information. You've had enough time. It's time to choose. And they have to come to a choice, to follow Jesus or to reject. And, and that's very much like... The, the birth process, the Bible also uses another illustration, and that's familiar to you gardeners. You, you cultivate the soil for the, all the weeds that have taken over all winter long, and then you prepare it, and you plant a seed. Have you noticed that good seeds don't come up by accident? <laughs> that you have to take care of them, you have to water them, you have to fertilize them, you have to cultivate, and then at some point there will be fruit. And so in the lives of those around us, God has called you in the school that you're going to, in the place where you work, in the neighborhood you're in. He's called you to show Jesus by your actions and your attitudes and your life. Not to be perfect, but to show Jesus, which often means when you blow it, you apologize eloquently. And then you need to share Jesus. And some people will come back and say, let's talk about this some more. I'm interested in that. I want to I wanna know what your thinking is about that or why did this happen or I've got this problem with the Bible. And when God prompts their hearts like that, you go, fish on. <laughs> yeah, this is a real deal. God is working on you and you get a chance to be a part of that process. And then the third option, it says, and then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and they won the crowd over. The verses I read, it says, they poisoned their minds. And they stoned Paul and dragged him outside of the city thinking he was dead. Ugh. Let me just say something I think this passage teaches us. I think a lot of us do not share about Jesus because we're afraid we might be rejected. We want to be liked. We want people to care about us. We, we want respect. We want people to agree. And if you say something about Jesus, even if you do it with gentleness and respect, if you do it carefully, some will believe, some will say, give me some time, and some will fight you. They may reject you. It may, be, it may be ugly. And I believe that part of what we need to do is to come to a readiness to say, okay, God, if that happens, I'm okay with that. Because actually, once you're accepted by God, who cares who else accepts you, right? That's where our security lies. And you know, it's, it's easy for us to be kind of Christians in a holy huddle, to talk about Christ when we're with, in church or in our life group and we're, we're fine with people who already share our beliefs. But to say something to somebody who doesn't yet follow Jesus, and some of you here today may be a part of that, I'm still thinking about it, crew. I, I'm, I'm interested in exploring and I want to find out more about what Jesus says. And for some of you, maybe today is the day where God's saying, you need to make a decision. You've been listening long enough. You have enough information. It's time to make a choice. And there's that attraction and repelling, just like the magnetism we're talking about. And, you know, sometimes people who first come to faith in Christ, they say, well, do I have to reject my friends? 
You know, the ones I've been hanging out and getting drunk with, the ones I've been doing drugs with. And I say, no, just start talking about Jesus. <laughs> just tell them what God's done in your life and how you're being changed and what's going on. And you know what? They'll either say, cool, tell me more about it, or they'll say, get out of here. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You just stay, stand for what's right, and they can reject you. And there is that tearing, isn't it? And it's painful to say, okay, I'm going to stand for Jesus. And Jesus warned us about it. He said, if they reject me, they will reject you. And if nobody is rejecting you, maybe you're not standing close enough to Jesus. Maybe you're not being as bold or as open or as honest about what is going on in you and what the truth is and what really matters. And you know what happened after this? They stoned Paul. They dragged him out of the city. They thought he was dead. And after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and he went back into the city. And the next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. You see how much it destroyed him? No, he shook the dust off his feet and he said, okay, next town. We're ready for the next one. Because you have to do a lot of striking out before you hit a home run. And a couple things just to share with you. You will have to share with a number of people and plant seeds and be part of the watering and cultivating process before you have the privilege of seeing come when someone come to faith in Christ. And when you actually, actually have that experience, it may be because somebody else has planted the seeds and been a part of the whole process, and you just get to be in on the fun part. But God has called us to do that. And he said that there is this response that may come, that there's some who will reject Christ. You know, I know that for parents, making a choice about school is a very vital and difficult one. And there are good reasons for homeschooling, and there are good reasons for putting your kids in a Christian school, and, and there are good reasons for putting your kids in public school. And I hope that all the parents understand the, the benefits and liabilities of each choice. But God led us to put our kids in public school. And because of that, it was the first place where they encountered people who didn't share this worldview of a follower of Jesus and who God was and what was right and wrong. In fact, there's a hilarious story. My youngest daughter, Rhonda, when she was in kindergarten, she was sitting next to a boy who was raised in a vigorously atheist home, shall we say, and he was telling her there was no God. And of course, her response is, teacher, 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 would you tell him there is two a God? <laughs> <laughs> and for the next 12 years, he gave her a bad time. He said things about her, he said things to her, and in her sophomore year, she walked into one of her classes, and on the board was written, Rhonda is going to hell. And the teacher left it up there a while because he didn't see it. And there was this tension. And we tried to help our kids have the vital kind of faith that can stand against the opposition. Can you follow Jesus when not everybody agrees with you, when you're not in your holy bubble? Let me tell you, it's a critically important skill because the gospel is becoming less and less what the normal main man, mainline culture believes. And so you and I have to say, am I willing to stand for the truth even if it invites a hostile reaction? And you know, the cool part of that story is it was a couple years ago, many years after high school, when he got a hold of her on Facebook, and he, he said, I want to apologize for being such a jerk to you in school. I don't know why I was so mean to you, but I'm sorry. And I don't know what the end of that story is going to be, but here's my second clue for you. Sometimes the people who are rejecting are closer to faith than the apathetic ones. It said there's... That, that's, core belief of an atheist is there is no God and I hate him. <laughs> that they're reacting against, that there's that repelling part of the magnetism that they're struggling with. And you know, at the core level, to choose to follow God, we've got to say, okay, I'm not God. And I will let you have control. And I will follow you. And following him means that we show Jesus with our lives, but it also means that we have the courage to share Jesus, even if it's not popular. 
And don't feel guilty about it. Don't feel concerned that you won't do it perfectly, that you won't know all the verses, that you won't do it just right. Because no matter how well you do it or how poorly you do it, God can use it. Because it's God that draws people to himself, isn't it? Let me ask you a couple questions as we wrap this up. Are you prepared to share? I already mentioned it, but for some of you today, that may mean that you need to choose to follow Jesus. A lady came up to me several weeks ago and was so blessed. She said, you know, I've gone to church all my life, but it was today that I surrendered my life to Jesus for the first time. You see, it's not a matter of information. It's a matter of transformation, isn't it? And when God gets a hold of somebody, it's always a miracle. And for some of you, maybe today is that day. And I'm going to pray in a few moments, and you can simply pray with me and say, God, come into my life and give me that eternal life that Pastor Paul is talking about. For some of you, you just need to be picking up that paper of the four spiritual laws and feel confident that you can have a few basic verses. With four verses and four laws, you can lead somebody to Christ. And you can plant the seed, and you can be part of that process in somebody's life. And for some of us, we need to say, am I ready for any reaction? Is it okay with me that if somebody rejects Christ, they also reject me? Am I okay with being that connected to Jesus that there's some rejection involved? Because you don't have to read very far through the New Testament to find out it's pretty common for people who follow Jesus. And I, feel, I hear people saying, oh, our country is going in such a bad way and they're so fearful and quite often we're just afraid about, it's going to feel bad for me. And you know, it's not a matter of passing new laws and changing people's morals, it's a matter of people finding Jesus because that's what changes hearts and ultimately that's what changes minds and what changes countries. So I believe that God calls every one of us to be ambassadors for him in the place that he's got us. You ever think about this? Maybe you're the only Jesus somebody ever sees, that you're the only one in that context. They never go to church, they're not listening to anything else, but they see you, and you have a chance to be Jesus to them. Father, thank you for these powerful principles from the book of Acts, where we see Paul just, just purposed to do whatever it was that he could do in his life to build a bridge to people so that he could tell them about the life-transforming power of the gospel. And God, I pray that you would stir us up and that we would begin to see people, even now as we pray, who are in our life that we need to lean in a little more and have a conversation with or ask them what their belief system is or, or begin to talk about the four laws. And Father, if there's anybody here today that has never yet trusted their life to you, maybe they say, oh, I believe in God, but Satan believes in God. They They've never come to that place of surrender. And I ask God that at this moment, the power of your spirit would draw them like a magnet and that they would surrender and say, Jesus, come into my life and forgive my sins and take over the steering wheel. I want you to run my life. I want to be a follower of Jesus. And Father, when that fear comes up of people maybe rejecting us or looking at us weird or talking about us behind our back, Help us to be so accepted by you that we don't care to try to be accepted by everybody else. That we would show that, that love and that fearlessness that the truth is the truth is the truth. And God, give us that privilege of being a part of planting the seed and watering and cultivating and someday maybe seeing that come to fruition. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really, and so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So... If you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.